going to start celebrating again in Pittsburgh very shortly. There are all kinds of stuff that's going to break loose here in Cincinnati in this ballpark and around town. A one-two pitch. There's a drive hit deep to right, way back, way back. It is a ball game. Big man Foster at third. They had him there with one out. Now they're two down. Here's the one-one pitch. Into the dirt. The action was equally heated in the American League playoff between Oakland and Detroit. Campanaris has had quite a day. Three hits, three times up. Stolen two bases, scored two runs. They're shortened up at the corners on him, and he is hit by a pitch ball. Instead of a yeah. trouble, that's Look out. trouble. That was game two, and Campanaris was suspended for the remaining three contests as the playoff was extended to the five-game limit. In game five, Oakland A's manager Dick Williams chose a daring piece of strategy for a key situation. Love to get green here so they can start off with Autumn in the next. The runners are going and free and throw through. Here comes Jackson on the way home and he is first to pin the run. And Jackson is hurt. Reggie Jackson's steal of home tied the score and paved the way for an Oakland victory. But Jackson suffered a severe hamstring injury. Without their star slugger in the lineup, the A's winning run was knocked in by a 225 hitter, Gene Tennis, a name that would be heard again and again as the Oakland A's meet the Cincinnati Reds in the 1972 World Series. The 1972 World Series is brought to you by your local bottler of Coca-Cola in association with Major League Baseball. A record crowd of almost 53,000 jams into Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium for the World Series opener. World Series host Commissioner Bowie Kuhn Welcome Cincinnati Executive Vice President and General Manager Bob Housen, Reds President Frank Dale, and National League President Chubb Feeney. The most disappointed man in the stadium, no question about it, Reggie Jackson, sideline for the entire World Series. Gary Nolan, 15 and five on the year, gets the opening game assignment on the mound for the National League champions. A's catcher Gene Tennis faces Nolan with two out, and one on in the second inning. Gene Tennis, only one for 17 in the playoffs against Detroit, homers in his first World Series at bat to propel Oakland to a two to nothing lead. The last time Oakland starter Ken Holzman pitched in Riverfront Stadium, he hurled a no-hitter for the Chicago Cubs. But singles by Bench and Perez, plus a walk to Menke, place him in a bases loaded jam in the bottom of the second. Dave Concepcion beats the attempt at an inning-ending double play, and Johnny Bench scores to cut the A's lead in half. Oakland has speed, personified by American League base stealing king, Campy Campanaris. But the Reds have the human shotgun in the National League's most valuable player, Johnny Bench. Oakland relies on his pitchers to minimize the Cincinnati running game. Here, Boltzmann's slick pickoff move traps Bobby Tolan. The Reds knock the game at two all in the bottom of the fourth, and Gene Tennis comes up for his second series of bat in the top of the fifth. Tennis, with but five home runs all season, sets a series record with round trippers his first two times up, and the A's regain the lead. 
Yeah, he couldn't get ahead of me. Then he threw me a breaking ball, which he uh, made a mistake, and uh, I did it again. I was fortunate enough to hit a home run. The first home run was probably the biggest drill. Of course, being here is probably my biggest drill, I have to say that. Holtzman nurses a 3-2 lead with Johnny Bench leading off the bottom of the sixth. Manager Dick Williams wastes no time going to ace reliever Raleigh Fingers. And Fingers proves to be the right man at the right time. In the bottom of the seventh, Gene Tennis calls for a pitch out with Dave Concepcion running. Tennis is throw right on the money, and he explains the timely strategy. Uh, I felt that we had one strike on you, Lander, at the time, and uh, I just felt that, you know, they, they may be running, and I saw Concepcion get a little bigger lead than uh, normal, so um, I took a gamble, and uh, consequently, uh, I called a pitch out, and I was able to throw the man out. That's his story. Dave Concepcion claims that Caponaris never touched him. Umpire Mal Steiner signals that Concepcion was tagged on the helmet, but Concepcion disagrees. Uh, the umpire make a mistake, you know. He say, take me in the head, and I never feel nothing in my head, you know. And he say, he take me in the head. Let's take another look at this controversial play from ground level as Caponaris attempts to apply the tag. Okay, now you call it. Pete Rose draws a walk, and the A's call on Vita Blue for relief. The 1971 Cy Young Award winner successfully smokes the Reds out to gain a save, and Oakland nails down game one of the 1972 World Series. Another record-breaking crowd for game two welcomes Jackie Robinson in pre-game ceremonies. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I would just like to say that I was really just the spoke in the wheel of the success that we had some 25 years ago. I would like to also say that I would be a real, real pleasure if Mr. Ricky could have been here with us today, but to the members of the family, my entire love and gratitude for the things that he's done over the years. And I also want to say how pleased I am that my family can be here this afternoon and to thank baseball for the tremendous uh, opportunities that it has presented to me and also for this thrilling afternoon. I'm extremely proud and pleased to be here this afternoon, but must admit I'm going to be tremendously more pleased and more proud when I look at that third base coaching line one day and see a black face managing in baseball. Thank you very much. Red starter Ross Grimley faces his counterpart Catfish Hunter in the second inning. Pete Rose unleashes a strong throw, but the speed of George Hendrick accounts for the first run of the day. Caponaris follows with a carbon copy, and Rose's arm is put to test again. Same play, different result. Dick Green loses the race, and Johnny Bench applies the tag. On the replay, Rose cuts it loose on the fly to home plate. Dick Green is out by 10 feet, and Oakland has only one run to show for five singles in the first two innings. Johnny Bench singles. Tony Perez walks to open the bottom of the second against Hunter. The A's 21 game winner is tough in the clutch as he fans Dennis Menke. Cesar Geronimo. And Ross Grimsley to escape the perils of the big red machine. Oakland's leading hitter Joe Rudy faces Grimsley in the third. 
And there it goes. And Joe Rudy's blast stretches the A's lead to two to nothing. He'd been pitching me away, mostly fastball this whole time, and uh, I had a feeling he might try to come in and jam me with a fastball. A lot of left-handers try to jam me with uh, two strikes on you, and uh, he got the ball up and a little bit more over the plate, and I think he wanted it. And uh, it was one of those pitches where he's got the meat part of the bat on it. In Rudy's next at bat, the second series controversy erupts as he fouls off a bunt attempt against reliever Pedro Borbone. The Reds claim the ball struck him outside of the batter's box. I want you to ask it. I want you to ask him. Hey, hey, the ball never hit him. He was had two feet. He had one foot in the batter's box yet. Sparky. How many have? One. He had one. He started to go out, and one was still in the batter's box when the ball came up and hit him. You know, Jim? Yes, you huh? He might be right. I don't know. I'm just telling you. Catfish Hunter carries his shutout into the ninth inning, and the A's defensive platoon, including Mike Hegan at first, is on the field. Tony Perez's leadoff single pumps life in the Cincinnati Hearts, with Dennis Menke coming up next. He tags that one, and Joe Rudy makes an unbelievable catch, and Perez has to hustle back to first. And now a second look at the catch that ranks among the most spectacular in World Series history. Rudy leaps and makes the grab backhanded while bracing himself against the wall. On the way down, his glove turns. You can see the ball showing through the back of the webby. An absolutely fantastic play that they'll be talking about for years to come. Now here's another look at that play with Joe Rudy himself explaining. When I first went to the outfield, uh, Joe DiMaggio was a coach with us and uh, working with me every day during spring training on learning how to turn your back to the ball when it's hit, going to the wall, and uh, turning back into the ball. It's, uh, it's a little tough because you have to take a step to your left and come back into the ball, and uh, it just takes lots of practice, and I think he was one of the greats at this, and uh, he taught me most of it. A thankful Dick Williams turns his thoughts to Cesar Geronimo. Mike Hegan stabs Geronimo's sizzler and records the second out with a second defensive gem of the inning. Now the Reds trail by a single run. Raleigh Fingers takes over the control. And the A's hold on and head for Oakland with a two-game lead. While the Reds realize that no team has ever dropped the first two at home and recovered to win. Heavy rains drenched the Bay Area for a solid week. And all the hopes and wishes of American League President Joe Cronin and Commissioner Bowie Kuhn could not deter the weatherman from reaching up his trick sleeve for one more storm at game time. In marked contrast to the previous night, Blue skies were present on Wednesday. Helicopters helped to dry out the field, and the ground rules were reviewed in depth. If the ball is on the field, it's in play. If it goes yeah. in, it's dead. I said it must go in the dugout. It's in there, it's dead. Outfield, the fence is beyond, must go out of the ballpark. If it hits the front of this, it's in play, but if it hits in here, it's dead. You didn't have a ground rule here before. Well, who's on find that dugout up there then? The ball's in play if you see it. If it goes inside, it's dead. With the two boys back of that little okay. fence, the ball goes in there, it's out of play. The ball must go in the stand for it to be dead. The bullpen's the same, the tarp is the same, the dugout is the same. Easy. No, no problem at all. You find it that confusing? The ground rules were no more confusing than Jack Billingham. A 500 pitcher during the season, Billingham had the A's baffled in the early going. In the third, Pete Rose works Blue Moon Odom for a walk with two down. Rose pressures Gene Tennis into a throwing error and gallops on the third. But Dick Green comes to the rescue on Joe Morgan's bid for a base hit. In the fifth, the Reds continue to run on tennis as Geronimo takes off.
but Odom strikes out the side to maintain the scoreless tie. Odom has a one hitter after six, but Tony Perez opens the seventh with a single. Menke sacrifices Perez to second, setting the scene for the most unusual play of the series. Cesar Geronimo singles to center. And Tony Perez heads for home. Perez scores in spite of that king-size flop between third and home. And the replay shows what happened. Geronimo's hit is slowed down by the wet outfield grass. Center fielder George Henry picks it up, makes that casual underhand throw into Campy Caponeris just as Perez hit the deck. Caponeris back to the plate, misses the opportunity to cash in on Perez's misfortune. Yeah, I, don't, I don't see Perez fall down, so I don't hear anybody who says anything, so I don't know what I throw. The Perez keeper gives the Reds their first lead of the series, one to nothing in game three. Vita Blue relieves Blue Moon Odom and faces Pete Rose in the eighth. And Dick Green shocks up his second brilliant fielding play of the night. Bobby Tolan singles following a walk to Joe Morgan. And Raleigh Fingers makes his third series appearance. Tolan steals second without drawing a throw. And that brings Dick Williams out of the dugout for one of his frequent strategy sessions. Raleigh Fingers reveals the substance of the discussion. He pointed to the on deck circle. He pointed to first base as if we were we were going to walk him, and he told me we were going to uh, have Gino stand up and uh, look like it was going to be an intentional walk, and then Gino would jump back down into the catcher's box, and uh, we pitched to him. Uh, Williams, he wanted me to throw a break and pitch, and he specifically said throw a slider and not a fastball. We threw a slider on the outside part of the play for a call strike three. Johnny Bench talks about the ploy from his point of view. Just as uh, fingers went into the windup or into his stretch, uh, I heard Joe Hollard be alert. So I got halfway ready, and he just made a great pitch on me. An Academy Award performance strikes out Bench, but the A's are still scoreless in the bottom of the ninth. And Clay Carroll methodically wraps up Billingham's shutout package, and the Cincinnati Reds win game three in Oakland. The fourth consecutive sellout crowd en route to the second biggest series attendance in history fills the Oakland Coliseum for game four. The visiting team has won the first three contests and the Bay Area fans are hopeful that trend can be reversed tonight with first game winner Ken Holtzman on the mound. Bench's single sends Tolan the third as the Reds mount a threat in the first inning. Bench is running, but Tennis holds on to the ball to preclude the possibility of a double steal. Holtzman fans Perez to end the inning. Cincinnati starter Don Gullett keeps the A's at bay with help from third baseman Dennis Menke and shortstop Dave Concepcion. Gene Tennis faces Gullet in the fifth. With the Oakland defense holding on against the reckless running of the Reds, Holtzman clings to a 1-0 lead. But Dave Concepcion opens the Reds eight with an infield hit. With two down, Vita Blue makes his third relief appearance and issues a walk to Joe Morgan. Morgan is running, and Bobby Tolan lines it into the right field corner. Concepcion and Morgan score on the double, and the Reds take the lead two to one.
Oakland manager Dick Williams calls on his bench in the bottom of the ninth with Pedro Borbon pitching for Cincinnati. Gonzalo Marquez has a pinch hit through the middle. He's replaced at first by speedster Alan Lewis. And Sparky Anderson comes to the mound. Nobody hurt. There's nobody hurt. The only one thing you've got to do is you've got to make this guy stop over there. All right. You don't have to throw over. I don't want you throwing over. Okay. Just make him stop. All Just right. hold him. Okay. Let's go to work. With Gene Tennis at the plate, Borbone becomes flustered. He forgets his manager's instructions, tries a pickoff move, and then falls behind Tennis two and one. And this time, Sparky's out with the hook. All right, Petey. It's a hell of a job. I'm gonna bring in the honk. Hell of a job. Go on in. You got the rush, and you want to get rid of the ball quick. Well, I'll tell you. The ball up high. After I just came out and told him not to throw over the first, he throws over. He's losing his concentration. Honk will be fine. Honk. We got two balls, one strike. We got plenty of room. All I want you to do is hold him. I don't want you to throw over anything. Just hold him. He ain't gonna run him. Just give him a farm. Two balls, one strike. Clay Carroll tries to lock it up for the big red machine. Southpaw Tom Hall ready, but Anderson decides to stick with Clay Carroll as left-handed pinch hitter Don Mincher comes up. With the game tied and the potential winning run on third, the mustachioed marvel Dick Williams selects his third pinch hitter of the inning. A new World Series record. And who can knock it? Angel Manguel faces Clay Carroll. Three pinch hitters, three base hits. And Dick Williams' Oakland A's pull it out to go two up. And wouldn't they just love to win the championship tomorrow in front of their home fans? No Bay Area team has ever captured a championship in any sport. And the Oakland fans are in a mood to celebrate. Their colorfully attired heroes are just one game away from baseball's world championship. And the whole world is beautiful today. Even the umpires would have to agree that things are looking good. Pete Rose leads off game five against Catfish Hunter. The A's owe their success to their efforts in stifling the top of the Reds' batting order. Rose, Morgan, and Tolan are four for 44 so far in the series. But Rose belts the first pitch of the game over the wall. Only his second hit. And the Reds jump off to a mighty quick one-run advantage. Cincinnati starter Jim McLaughlin's in trouble in the second with two on and Gene Tennis up. It's his fourth home run of the series and it puts his name in the record book next to Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Hank Bauer and Duke Snyder. Dennis Minkey faces Hunter in the Reds' fourth. And like Pete Rose, Minkey's home run is only his second hit of the series. But it brings the Reds back to within one run at 3-2 to two Oakland. Gonzalo Marquez gets the nod from Dick Williams to do his instant pinch hit act against Pedro Borbone in the fourth. Sal Bando scores, and it's now Oakland four and Cincinnati two. But the A's blow a chance for the big inning as Bench hangs tennis up on a missed squeeze play. Bobby Tolan comes up with two out. 
Gil Morgan on first in the top of the fifth inning. Morgan scores all the way from first on Tolan's single, and the A's lead is sliced four to three. The next time Morgan reaches base in the eighth inning, Raleigh Fingers devotes some effort to keeping him in check. But Joe Morgan is not easily discouraged, and he steals second with ease. Fingers, relieving for the fifth time, turns his attention to Bobby Tolan. Come Joe Morgan to score and tie the game at four to four. In the ninth, Cesar Geronimo leads off for the Reds with a bouncing single through the hole. Ross Grimsley gets set to sacrifice. Sal Bando yells, let it drop to Raleigh Fingers with a double play in mind. But the plan backfires, and it takes an acrobatic play by Ted Kubiak to retire Grimsley as Geronimo moves to scoring position. Or, as Dick Williams put it, We didn't plan it that way. Now Pete Rose. And he singles Geronimo home, and the Reds take a one-run lead, going to the bottom of the ninth inning. Oakland skipper Dick Williams looks to duplicate the last ditch magic of the previous day with Blue Moon Odom running for Gene Tennis and Dave Duncan pitch hitting. Campanera steps in with only one out. Runners on first and third. Odom attempting to score on a short pop fly foul is out. Morgan the bench. And the game is over. On the replay, Blue Moon Odom comments. I think it was a good game because uh, Martin was going back and he was playing the ball off banners and plus the turf was wet. And I gave it a try and uh, I thought I was in, but uh, actually I was out on par set. But it was a close play. It was a good gamble. But Johnny Bench had the play block. Odom loses his gamble and it's back to Cincinnati for game six. Never mindful that they've lost seven straight home games in World Series play, the Reds are still very happy indeed to make that long trip back home. And speaking of traveling, Oakland manager Dick Williams gets around pretty well himself. Gets a start after three relief outings, and the game remains scoreless into the fourth inning. Gary Nolan calls on Pete Rose and Bobby Tolan to protect his one-run margin in the fifth. But this shot by Dick Green is off the wall, and Sal Bando streaks home with a tying run. Al McRae faces blue in the Reds' fifth. Gray takes third on an infield out, and Dave Concepcion delivers the tiebreaker.
With two down in the Cincinnati six, Bobby Tolan sends Vita Blue to the showers. Bob Locker comes on to try and keep it close. Tolan pays heed to the scoreboard's appeal, and now let's follow the bouncing ball. Following a walk to bench, the series leading hitter Tony Perez comes through again. Pedro Borbon works on Angel Manguel in the top of the seventh. Hell of a job, Peter. But he's going to have to bring his other catcher, Duncan, in here. Sparky Anderson has specific instructions for bench and new relief man, Tom Hall. Only reason Mitch has got, got him over there as a good low ball hitter. And I'm going to make him bring up that other catcher, Duncan. Duncan is a fastball hitter. Low fastball. Low fastball. Tommy, you know Duncan. Low fastball hitter. Right? Hall follows Sparky's advice and fans Duncan with a high fastball. The Reds return to the running game in the home seven. This time it's Dave Concepcion with a theft. Pete Rose receives an intentional walk, and with two out, it's up to Joe Morgan. Dave Hamilton is finding that third out is tough to come by, with Bobby Tolan up now. Here's Joe Horland looking for that elusive inning ending out. But Cesar Geronimo knocks in two more runs, and a big red machine finally explodes with a resounding eight to one victory. It's the first time a 1972 World Series game has not been decided by a one run margin. And the scene is set now for a seventh game showdown. Heavy skies and a light rain threaten the final game but it doesn't dampen the enthusiasm for baseball. Riverfront Stadium is bulging at the seams with a capacity crowd that includes 5,000 standees and the weather picture brightens by game time. The Reds' third game stopper, Jack Billingham, gets the starting assignment. With one down in the A's first, Angel Manguel lines to center. Bobby Tolan misjudges the ball and it rolls all the way to the fence. The slow motion replay shows Tolan still had a chance to make the catch, but the ball glances off the top of his glove for a three base error. Manguel remains on third as Billingham faces that man again, Gene Tennis, with two out. The ball takes a high hop, bounces off Menke's glove, and the A's grab an early one to nothing lead. The replay shows the second bounce lands squarely on a seam in the AstroTurf, causing an erratic hop, and Tennis has a run-producing single. Blue Moon Odom silences the Cincinnati bats for the first three innings with a new battery mate, Dave Duncan. Tennis is playing first in the revamped Oakland lineup. In the fourth, Joe Morgan walks and Odom pays special attention to keeping him honest. The ever-daring Morgan takes off anyway, but this time Dave Duncan guns him down.
In the home fifth, Tony Perez collects his 10th hit of the series. Odom exits after walking Geronimo and going two and one on Concepcion. Catfish Hunter completes the free walk and the bases are now loaded for Hal McRae. Pedro Borbone takes over with a score tied at one to one. But Campaneros greets him with a single to open the Oakland sixth. Two outs later, Camp is on third with Gene Tennis up. Campanera scores a tie-breaking run as Tennis pulls in a second with a double. Gene Tennis departs for pinch runner Alan Lewis, but not before he sets a new seven-game slugging mark and puts the most valuable player award under lock and key. Mando's blast bounces off the fence as Tolan goes down, and the A's now have a three to one advantage. Bobby Tolan might have had a chance for the catch if he didn't fall. The replay clarifies the picture. As Tolan moves back in the ball, it appears he has a 50 50 chance of catching up with it. Now watch his left leg. Just as he reaches the edge of the warning track, he suddenly clutches for the back of his left leg and it gives out on him. An untimely hamstring pull. And any chance to retire Bando goes with it. Catfish Hunter keeps the scoreboard status quo into the eighth inning. Pete Rose leads off. Enter Southpaw Ken Holtzman to pitch to Joe Morgan. Again, Raleigh fingers for his sixth appearance in seven games. And when Johnny Bench is intentionally walked, it puts the potential winning run on the base pads. A risk Dick Williams will have to live with all his life if Tony Perez comes through for Cincinnati. With Dennis Menke up, bench breaks for second, and the A's concede the base to stop the double steal attempt that could tie it all up. Menke short fly ends the rally. It all comes down to the bottom of the ninth in game seven, and as the final out of the 1972 World Series settles in Joe Rudy's glove, the Oakland A's are the world champions of baseball. Makes my happiness 